So, we are going to review last week's lesson and then jump into this week's. Last week's lesson was, if the law could save us, then Jesus died for nothing. That's what Paul's point at the end of chapter 2. If He said, I'm not going to... Uh, I'm not going to confuse grace. Uh, I'm not going to make grace worthless. If the law could save us, then Christ died for no reason. And the exact way he worded that, I am not one of those who treats the grace of God as meaningless. For if we could be saved by keeping the law, then there was no need for Christ to die. Uh, that's the bottom line. That's why I got last week's title. Uh, if the law could save us. You know, I'm going to look up something here that I'm going to read to you real quick. It will only take a second. Um, Martin Luther, the great reformer of the uh, 1400s, had been a monk in the Catholic Church. And uh, as a monk, he thought God was always angry at him. Um, he'd run in lightning storms to get inside and say, please don't kill me, Lord, please don't kill me, I'll do better. Um, so he was a monk, and uh, he believed that you had to be really good to get to heaven and that he was always measuring up short. And he was so tormented that the weed priest. I, um, I think he had another title there, but in the area where Martin Luther was a, a monk, said, we gotta, uh, said to himself, we got to do something to fix this guy. So he sent him off uh, to a Catholic Bible school. Um, and when he was there and began to study the Bible, he discovered things they weren't teaching him. He discovered this miracle that they sang about this morning, mercy. Mercy. He discovered grace. And uh, they wanted to kill him after a while for it. Um, like many people over the centuries that preached the gospel of Jesus Christ, their lives were threatened, some died. There's a book, I've never read it all, I've read uh, parts of it, Fox's book, Book of Martyrs talks about people who have died throughout the centuries for no other reason than their love for Christ. And um, Martin Luther uh, certainly thought he was going to, but in Germany um, the king was heavily persuaded by the Catholic Church and he didn't want to. Um, make the Catholic Church mad at him because he thought that could result in his not going to heaven, the king. But Martin Luther didn't just learn truth himself. He taught it, and many of the leaders, they had, I can't think of what they called them, but in America we would call them states. Different provinces there in Germany at that time. And they all had different leaders of those. And they all got saved through Martin Luther King's uh, teaching. Uh, not Martin Luther King, I'm sorry, Martin Luther's teaching. And um, one of the cardinals of the Catholic Church was there with them wanting to do away with uh, Martin Luther translated the Bible into German so they could people could read the Bible themselves and they wanted to do away with the German Bible and uh, so the king had brought all those leaders I don't know if there was 13 or 14 of them from the different areas of Germany and said Sunday we're all going to worship together in the Catholic Church and and um, now, I'm not blaming today's Catholic Church for some of the persecution they've done over the years. That's, that's at the feet of the persecutors. So don't misunderstand me that I'm condemning the Catholic... Today's Catholic leaders didn't do that. And to my knowledge, today's Catholic leaders have burned no Joan of Arcs at the 
uh, uh, in the fire like the old Catholic Church did. Um, so this does not lay at their feet, so don't misunderstand what I'm saying. But a man came forward, one of the leaders of one of those areas, and said to his king, I will not give up my way of worshiping God and talking about, I will not give up the German Bible. Uh, and he said to his king, I would rather die. You can take your sword and cut my head off, but I will not do what you've asked. And he put his head down. And one by one, those other leaders came up and stood by him with their head down. So now the king had a problem. He's either going to disappoint that cardinal sitting next to him or kill the 14 leaders of the... Uh, I'm guessing at the number 14. I, I can't remember how many. And so he relented to the leaders and said, Worship God the way you want. If those leaders hadn't forced his hand by volunteering their heads, Martin Luther would have been killed too. But because they refuse to do that, you're not going to take my worship away from me. I'd rather be dead. Can you imagine? One by one they made that. The king was angry. They had no idea what he would do, but they offered him their head. And so Martin Luther um, quit teaching things like um, the law. And um, he started teaching the grace of God. And when he was teaching on Galatians chapter 5, verse 1, listen to what Martin Luther writes. In this passage, passage 5, is, uh, verse 1, is stand fast in the liberty wherewith Christ has made us free, and be not entangled again with the yoke of bodies. That's verse 1 of Galatians 5. And in, Paul, in Luther's commentary on that verse, he said, In this passage, Paul again disparages the pernicious notion that the law is able to make men righteous before God. Listen to this. A notion deeply rooted in man's reason. All mankind is so wrapped up in this idea that it is hard to drag it out of people. That's the battle we have when we preach grace. The reason a man says, I must do better. The reason a man said, I got to keep more rules. Then God will love me. And last week's lesson was, boy, if you could do that, then Jesus didn't have to die. If righteousness could come by the law of Moses or by any other set of rules. If the law could, I mean, if, if righteousness could come by the law of Moses or any other set of rules. Or, in other words, if I could make myself acceptable by God, to God, by gritting my teeth and trying really hard to keep all the rules. Then Christ died needlessly. Christ had to die for us because there was no other way to salvation. He had to pay the penalty for our sins, and we have to come through Jesus to get to heaven. So that's what last uh, week's lesson was about. Now, let's go on to this week's lesson. He gets into chapter 3. Uh, I got the first nine verses. I don't know if I'll get through them, but I, I'm going to try. Uh, but verses 2 and 3... Verse 1 is where I got my title. But verses 2 and 3 are amazing. If you can catch on to verses 2 and 3 of Galatians 3, it'll help you understand Paul's writings. He gives us a framework of how to understand what he's talking about in his other epistles as well. So, let's start with verse 1. O foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you that you should not obey the truth, before whose eyes Jesus Christ has been evidently set forth, crucified among you? 
Now that first part, O foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you? Let me uh, share with you two other renditions, more modern than the King James Version. The one I read to you with the King James. But there is a Bible called the Contemporary English Bible, and they rendered that verse, that first part of verse 1 this way, where the King James renders the Greek, O foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you. The Contemporary English Version renders it this way, You stupid Galatians! Has someone now put an evil spell on you? That's where I got my title. How stupid can we sometimes be? You stupid Galatians! A rendition of the New Testament, a translation, or a paraphrase called the Message. Some of you have probably seen that, or the Message. They rendered verse 1 of chapter 3 this way. You crazy Galatians! Did someone put a hex on you? Have you taken leave of your senses? Something crazy has happened. In the Greek, commentators will tell you, as abrasive as it sounds for Paul to write in the King James Version, O foolish Galatians, that it doesn't capture the Greek. Remember, the New Testament was written in Greek. When Paul wrote it, it was much stronger language than that. And so with that in mind, the contemporary English version might be a little more accurate of that. Oh, stupid Galatians. Now, I don't know if Paul was in the name calling, but um, he was saying something about that strong, uh, about that strong. Maybe it wasn't that abrasive. Um, you know, the way I worded the title is a little less abrasive, but it's saying the same thing. How stupid can we sometimes be? Now, it's less abrasive because I'm not saying, Daryl, you're stupid. So I'm wording it different. But that basically, in the Greek, evidently what the Apostle Paul was doing when he wrote that first verse. He could not believe. Now, remember, Galatians, it wasn't a city. It was a province. It was an area where there were several cities. Again, we might call it a state if it had been in America. A state where there are mayors in cities throughout uh, our state. Um, we're in Iowa, aren't we? Uh, throughout Iowa, we got mayors in every city. And, um, and so Galatians was a smaller version of the United States. Obviously, it wasn't near as big. But... It wasn't a city like when Paul wrote the epistle to the Ephesians, that was a city, Ephesus. Ephesus was a city. Here, Paul wrote a letter uh, to a region, and uh, the idea was the church that it initially was sent to was to read it, copy it, and carry it to one of the other churches in that same area until um, Paul's message got along uh, around. But Paul had established those churches. What happened in Paul's life, he would go where no man had preached before. That was the call of God in his life that he felt. He didn't want to build in somebody else's uh, work. He wanted to go and start from the ground up. And so he would go and establish churches in different towns. He would leave town. Sometimes he'd stay as long as two years to get the church really up and running. Uh, other times it was uh, less than two years, sometimes much less. And when he felt there was somebody there that he could leave in charge of the church, like if you're there two years, you're really pouring your teaching into one or two people there in a certain church, and you would put them in charge, kind of like the pastor. And... Um, other times, he would leave one of his team members behind when he would leave. He would leave Timothy or somebody else behind to help that church grow. Uh, but when everybody left town, and now the church was left to its converts, and whoever 
grabbed a hold of it and they had named a pastor. Um, then the false teachers would come in. And the false teachers would attack Paul's doctrine of grace. The New Testament, many of these, you read the commentaries, this word is not in the New Testament, Judaizer. You hear me use it often because that's what scholars, biblical scholars, have named some of these false teachers. They were Jews who claimed to have given their lives to Christ. In other words, they claimed to be Christian Jews. I use the word claim. I mean, I don't know them. I haven't seen it in their heart. But Paul called, referred to at least some of them as brothers falsely so-called. In other words, Paul said they're not true true brothers in the Lord. Uh, Of some of them. Perhaps not all of them, but of some of them. But these were Jews who wanted to bring Moses into the Gentile church. So by Moses, I mean the law of Moses. The Ten Commandments and all the other laws. So when Paul would leave town building the church on the grace of God, they would come in and they would say, now, yeah, now that you're saved by putting your faith in Christ, now to stay saved, you have to keep the law of Moses. And so that's what Paul's referring to here. In verse 1, he's in essence saying, I painted you a verbal picture of the death and burial and resurrection of Christ. I preached it in essence... I preached it so plainly to you, painted such an exacting verbal picture that you should have seen that picture up here. And it should have been so impressed on your brain that these crazy legalists who come into town and tell you the grace of God isn't sufficient on its own, you must add Moses to it. You must keep the law of Moses. Paul said, how foolish are you? You hear me say it all the time. You can't marry Moses to Jesus. It's one or the other. You're saved by keeping all the rules or you're saved by faith alone plus nothing. That was Martin Luther's doctrine. Faith plus nothing. Period. What saves you is putting your faith in Jesus Christ. You say, I don't have to live right to go to heaven? Your living right has nothing to do with you going to heaven. Or Jesus died in vain. Then why should I live right? Because Ephesians 2.10, the Apostle Paul writes, that you are a new creation created unto good works. When you put your faith in Christ, you didn't get off your knees the same person you were when you went down. And not everybody gets on their knees after Jesus in their heart. I'm using that as a symbol with them. If you didn't bow on your knees, you bowed in your heart. And when you got up, you were not the same person you were when you got down. If any man be in Christ, he's a new creation. Behold, uh, I mean, old things pass away. Behold, all things have become new. Second Corinthians five seventeen. Something happens when you get saved. It's not not just words you speak. The you that got up was not the you that went down. And because that new creation, God tinkered with you when you got saved. He made you something different than you were. And in making you something different, He created you to do good. I don't do good things to get to heaven. I do good things because God put the desire to do good things in me when He saved me. It's got nothing to do with my going to heaven. But that's not what the Judaizers taught. And so, in, verse, in chapter 1 of this, Paul said, If anybody come and preach to you a different doctrine than the one I preach to you, let him be cursed. That's how important the doctrine of grace is. Paul said, If anyone comes to town, and, and because they had, 
and teaches you any other gospel than the one I taught you. Let them be cursed. Not a witch's curse. Separated from God. That wasn't strong enough for Paul. So he said, if an angel steps out of heaven and comes down and preaches to you any other gospel than the one I preached to you, let that angel be cursed. That wasn't strong enough for Paul. So he said, if I come back and preach to you any other gospel than the one I've already preached, let me be cursed. That's how adamant Paul was about this gospel. So he's calling these Galatians foolish. I don't think I'm going to get past verses 2 and 3 this morning. Uh, They're so important I want to spend the last uh, uh, few minutes we have on them. So when he's asking them how foolish they are, he says in verse 2, this only what I learn of you. So he says, let me ask you a question. It's in essence what he's saying. I want to understand your stupidity, your foolishness. So this only what I learn of you. Here's the question I have for you, Paul said. Received you the Spirit, In other words, when did the Holy Spirit move in? When you got saved, right? So he's saying, how did you begin this Christian walk? Received you the Spirit, or did you get saved? And he gives them two options. How did you get saved? Option A or option B. All right? This is what I want to learn from you, Galatians. Received you the Spirit, or did you get saved? Option one. By the works of the law, or option two, by the hearing of faith? It's called a rhetorical question. It has an understood answer. He shows us the understood answer in the way he words verse 3. So he said, there's only two ways Christians teach you can get saved, even back then, and in town today. The two ways Christians teach you you can get saved is by faith or by works. Now, in Paul's day, the works were always the works of the law of Moses. Today, some of the churches teach works, but they don't necessarily teach that you got to keep Moses' law, but they'll have all kinds of rules for you to keep. So option A, Paul said, did you get saved this way? By keeping enough rules to make God happy with you. Which he ended the last chapter by saying, if you get saved that way, then Jesus didn't need to die. So the rhetorical question has the understood answer. You got saved by the hearing of faith. You heard the gospel and believed it. That's what the word faith means. You believe something. All right. So, now look at what he says in verse 3. This will give you an understanding when you study Paul's Gospels or Paul's Epistles. This will help you in so many, because he gets to this in some, uh, in every epistle he writes, he gets to this somewhere in there. They're not all like Galatians and Romans that this is the main topic of his epistle. But he gets to this stuff in every epistle except maybe Philemon. He'll hint at it, but Philemon's a, a different creature altogether. That's about a runaway slave being reunited with the slave owner. So, listen to what he said. You get saved by the work of the law or by the hearing of faith. Verse 3, are you so foolish? Having begun in the Spirit, are you now made perfect by the flesh. Paul talks often about how we walk as Christians. Do we walk in the Spirit or in the flesh? What's that mean? Well, we're going to find out here. What does that mean? He doesn't always use in the flesh or in the Spirit. Sometimes he uses by the flesh or by the Spirit. Sometimes he uses of the flesh or of the Spirit. But however he words it, he's talking about the same thing in all these. You say, exactly what's he doing here? The first thing, put that page over, if you will. What is Paul's point in verses 2 and 3? 
Let's compare the two verses. To give you a premise of what I'm doing, how many of you remember in your word puzzle books? Any of you ever buy those word puzzle books? And they have crossword puzzles, they have different kind of word games. And maybe even in school they had you do this. Two sides of the paper. Words on one side, short definitions on the other. And your assignment was to draw a line from the word to the correct definition on the other side. You ever remember doing that? Sometimes they were... You never did that there on school? Joni, you remember doing that at all? Uh, you me- there, there. She remembers I'm saved. Uh, anyway, um, and they are in word puzzle books too. You can find them. So, let's say they have ten words over here on the left side of the paper, then they have ten short definitions on the right side. Your job is to, if you start at the top word, read the top word and look down at the ten definitions and decide which one you think describes that top word, and then you draw a line from that word to that word. Well, here's why that's important to us. That's, in essence, what verses 2 and 3 are. We've got two words, faith and spirit, are believing, believing in faith, or the, believing and, not believing in faith, believing and faith. In the uh, scripture, the same thing, you're trusting God. So, you've got two definitions in verse 3. you begun in the spirit, not definitions, I mean, you got the two words. Spirit, flesh. Will you now be made perfect in the flesh? Now, actually, there are little phrases as opposed to words. You got saved by the Spirit. Are you now going to be made perfect by the flesh? Verse, that's in verse 3. Verse 2 gives you the definitions of those two words. You got to figure out which one to apply to which. So he said, this only what I learned from you. Receive the Spirit, or did you get saved by obedience to the law? There's the definition. By the works of the law, what the King James said. By the works of the law, or by the hearing of faith. That's verse, then the definitions in verse 2. So, you take the word, having begun in the Spirit, that phrase, in the Spirit, which of these two definitions in verse 2 applies to that by the works of the law or by the hearing of faith well the rhetorical uh, question meant, meant there was an understood answer you got saved by believing the gospel by faith so under uh, uh, on the back side there you will see this I put this down let's compare verses 2 and 3 from the above passage by the works of the law, verse 2, or by the hearing of faith, or by, or rather by the hearing of faith, yeah, underneath it. So on the right side you uh, have verse 2 there, by the works of the law, or by the hearing of faith. On the other side you have the corresponding parts of verse 3, by the flesh and the spirit. In other words, Paul said, Having begun, in verse 3, having begun in the Spirit. Now, what does the Spirit in verse 3 apply to in verse 2? By the hearing of faith. You heard the gospel and you believed it. So he said, having begun in the Spirit, will you now be perfected? Or will you spiritually grow? Will you turn over your your, your spiritual growth to the process of keeping rules? You started in the Spirit. Are you now going to be perfected by the flesh? Well, you see on the back here, by the flesh means the works of the law. So Paul is trying to teach us something in verse 3. What made the Galatians foolish? How stupid can we be? There's only one way to get saved. you got to believe the gospel. Romans 1.16, the Apostle Paul said, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, but the power of God unto salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. 
of the Gentile. I forget which word it uses there. Um, because sometimes it says it replaces Gentile with Greek. But nonetheless, so he says, here's how you get there. I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God on salvation. I want you to get this. There's one message on planet Earth, and one only, that can get you from here to heaven. And that's the gospel of Jesus Christ. There is no back door, side door, just the front door. Jesus said, I am the door. Jesus said, no man come down to the Father but by me. You've got to go through Jesus to get to the Father, which means you've got to go through Jesus to get to heaven. One message, the gospel. And then he said in the next verse, 17 of Romans 1, he said, not only is it the only way to heaven or the only way to be saved, it's the only way to teach you once you're a Christian how to walk your life in a right relationship with God. The gospel does those two things. Makes you fit for heaven. In other words, it gets you ready to go to heaven. And then helps you walk out your life from the day you get up from asking Jesus into your heart until the day you go home to meet him in heaven. It teaches you that you have been made right with God so you can combat combat all the lies the devil will throw at you throughout your lifetime. He's, a, he's an accuser of the brethren, the Bible says. Later on, I tell you, in Romans 8, Paul attacks that. Paul attacks it. The devil used to be able to accuse us to God, but now Paul says in chapter 8, Romans, you're going to accuse, uh, the devil going to accuse someone to God? It's God who justified them. God put his judicial robe on and as the judge of the universe sat down. When I put my faith in Jesus Christ, he picked up his gavel and brought it down and said, Dave, you are now justified before me. You are right with me. There is nothing, Dave, nothing that separates you from me. I declare it by the authority authority of who I am, God Almighty. So the devil, what's he going to do? Is he going to accuse me to God? God's the one who brought the gavel down. Is he going to accuse me to Christ? He says in Romans 8, Christ is the one who died for my sins, for crying out loud. And whoever lives to intercede for me. Who's the devil in he- gonna, when the devil goes up before God in heaven to accuse Who's he going to accuse me to in heaven that gives a care what he says? So you know what he does instead? Since he can't do anything up there, he accuses me to others. But that, you know that none of us have everybody liking us all the time. But here's the real stickler. He accuses me to me. He accuses you to you because he wants to interrupt this beautiful relationship you have with God by you doing the Adam thing. After you eat the fruit, you run and hide. You're so ashamed because the devil accused you to you that you don't talk to God for a while. You don't pick up his Bible for a while. He'll have some success accusing you to you. He'll have zero success accusing you to God. God has forever forgiven you. Think of the worst... We're not going to ask for verbal confession, so don't worry. Think of the worst thing you've done that makes you most ashamed when you remember in the last year. The worst thing, just between your mind, uh, of course, God knows what's in your mind. He's already known, so you're not going to shock him. Think of the what you consider the worst thing you've done this calendar year. Let's put it that way, 2020. I don't think anyone in here shot the neighbor and buried him in their basement. I don't think. 
Uh, but just think of that. I got I got something to tell you about that. The devil comes and says, how could you be a real Christian? Real Christians wouldn't do that. You know the day God saved you? He already knew you were going to do that. And he saved you anyway. Every stinking, filthy sin I've committed since the day I was saved, 55 years ago, somewhere around there, when he saved me, God lives everywhere in time. He knew about every one of those sins. And he saved me anyway. So here's what I want you to take from this lesson that will help you when we talk about Paul. If you could get it up here and never let it out of here. When Paul talked about walking in the flesh and walking in the Spirit, in the flesh there isn't talking just about your physical body. Usually if he's going to talk about your body, he'll use the word body. But what he's talking about when he's talking about walking in the flesh is you're trying to live for God with your own fleshly abilities. That's where the law comes in. You think God gave Moses the law, therefore I should keep the law and I will grip my teeth. My willpower can do this. I will try harder till I get it right. That's walking in the flesh. Walking in the Spirit is understanding that I'm saved by faith alone. Now, what do I do from that point on? What does faith mean in closing? Abraham believed God and it was counted to him for righteousness. Romans 4. It'll be later in chapter 3 of Galatians. We'll get to it some next week. Why does Abraham come into this discussion in the Old Testament? He believed God, it was counted to him for righteousness. What did he believe God about? He was discouraged at 75. God said, get up and leave your home here. Go where I tell you to go, and I'm going to raise up of you a great nation. Now, what do you have to have to have a nation come from you? Got to have a child, right? God promised Abraham at 75 years old he'd have a child. The problem was he was married to a woman who was barren. And now they were getting old. Getting old. 75 wasn't as old then as it is today. Abraham lived to be 150. But he was middle age. And it took another 25 years for the baby, the promised baby to be born. And at one point, even before Ishmael was born, 13 years before Isaac, and that toward the end of that first 12 years when he had no sons. He's whining to God. How many ever whined to God? He's whining to God. You promised me a child and all. When I die, my inheritance is going to go to my servant. I got no one else to leave it to. It's going to go to my servant, God. Come here, Abraham. Abraham, right there. So Abraham goes outside in, in the evening, in the nighttime, said, look up. And he looks up and clear night he can see all the stars. God said, count the stars. And if you can count them, that's how many descendants you will have. Abraham didn't start counting. Instead he felt shame and once again reaffirmed his faith in God. And it was counted to him for righteousness. That's where we find that statement. What did Abraham believe? Now listen carefully. He believed what God said about him. Not just any generic belief. He, not just anything God said. We want to believe everything he said. But the faith that was counted to him for righteousness was believing what God said to him about him. What has God said about you? I don't have time to start today, but there are so many wonderful things in the New Testament that God has said about you. Put your faith in the first thing He said about you. He asked Jesus into your heart. 
you'll be saved. He said that about you. That's why you sit here on your way to heaven. You believed what he said to you. And that's the way you're going to grow spiritually, by believing other things he said about you. And we're going to cover some of them over time.